Council Member Cole. Here. Council Member Schwer. Here. Council Member Wong. Here. Council Member Nordby is running late. And Council Member Mongi. Here. All right, thank you. <clears throat> Motion to adopt the agenda. So moved, Your Honor. I'll second. Second member by Schwerz. All those in favor, say aye. 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 All right. Topics. McKnight Field. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. So tonight, um, we're all going to be talking about the McKnight Field Complex. Um, <clears throat> there's many aspects of this. Um, Brandy's put together a really good report. Um, but we'll be covering uh, the McKnight Field, um, the McKnight Fields themselves, the Kunkel Field, the uh, Triple Crown Batting Cages, the Polar Charity, who does the work at the concession stands at the McKnight um, Softball Fields, and Ball Field Reservations. Um, so with that, I will turn it over to Brandy and to discuss. It's going to be a lot of information dumped for you guys tonight, so it's going to be just back and forth and give us some guidance. If you're looking for some more information, then um, we'll follow up with what needs to be taken care of for any requests that you guys have. Okay. Good. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. This is going to be another history lesson, I think. Um, so I spent a good portion of last week doing another deep dive into the files to learn about the McKnight Field area. And this is a presentation of what I found. It's not in any linear sort of order, but I'll try to make it make sense as much as I can. So what I learned is that the total area of the McKnight Field complex is what I'm going to call it, is 21 and a half acres. And that includes the baseball field, which is now called Kunkel Field, the four softball fields, two tennis courts, a t-ball field, the parking lots, and the batting cages and the concession stands, which is in the middle of the softball fields. Part of the land was acquired in 1969 through an eminent domain process and through a HUD grant. And so there are some limitations on that particular area in terms of what can be done with that land. It must be preserved in perpetuity recreational purposes. The exact boundary of that 11 uh, 0.7 acres is unknown without having a surveyor kind of draw it out for us, but I believe that it's approximately the, does my pointer work? I think it's Kunkel Field um, about from, I think the 11th Avenue area south is kind of roughly it, um, but that's just going on what I believe to be the boundary based on the old plat map and kind of the legal description that I could piece together. So the existing conditions of the McKnight complex kind of vary depending on what you're looking at. So in the whole, it needs a little bit of refurbishment, uh, a refresh I think is how Ron put it. He said that we need uh, new fencing around the entire site and the interior trail and parking lots require uh, paving. You can see that from the image here, the trail to the concession stand is in some rough shape. The tennis courts are also in disrepair and the t-ball field is in poor condition and there's some elements that are missing. The softball fields are in need of some refurbishment and maintenance as well. Kunkel Field is in pretty good condition. It was updated with the efforts of the school district. They covered the cost to rebuild the pitching mound, which was about $14,000. The project included regrading, resodding, and spreading ag lime. The school also built the press box in 2003. I did not have the value of that um, in the records that I saw. Most recently, the school district has proposed to install a new scoreboard. Uh, there's an image of it on the screen. According to their proposal, it would um, the school district would pay for the scoreboard. Uh, they would use the four ad spots to pay for that cost, and they would not accept any uh, further ad revenue after that. So according to the district representatives, um, the, propo the proposal does not include any revenue that would go, uh, sorry, I said that. Um, if, if the school district, if the city uh, agrees to accept the scoreboard, then staff recommends that we engage with the city attorney to put a prepared agreement that would uh, that would uh, identify ownership and maintenance responsibilities. So then we've got a couple of lease agreement 
agreements that have been in place um, in one kind of an, a resolution, it's not really an agreement, but it was a, a resolution that was adopted in 1979. The first one I'll talk about is the agreement with the school district. So the city has had an agreement in place since about 1974. The most current one with the school district is dated 2011. That agreement has been in place for over a decade, and there's been a lot of changes that have occurred um, since then. The school district has a lot of new staff, as does the city. Uh, the school operations and the city operations are no longer the same as they were uh, 10 years ago. The main difference at the city is that we no longer offer a youth program, and so we don't have a, a need to use school district facilities any longer. And from what I understand over the past few months of working here and the limited amount of documentation I could find is that there's kind of a muddled history on the implementation of that agreement. Um, there's not always been strict adherence to it by either the school district or the city. In terms of the um, field maintenance, capital improvements, or, or fees. So over the past few months, uh, city staff, we've been looking at the agreement and we've had a couple of conversations with the school district initially to start the renegotiation process. And so what we've learned from that so far is that both parties are in general agreement that the informal practices of the past are not gonna continue, and that what we come up with for a future agreement will be the go-to guide in the policy document in all things related to, to the use of main, uh, McKnight Field for the maintenance and the, and the improvements. And then we've got two other agreements, triple crown batting cages and polar charities. So in 1992, the city entered into an agreement with triple, triple crown, wherein the, um, the leasee agreed to construct the batting cage facility in exchange for no rent for 15 years. And that terminated in 2008. Then in that year, uh, a 10 year extension was authorized that terminated in 2018. There was an automatic renewal built into that one, and so that will expire in June of this year. So in terms of concessions, um, Polar Charities was the other uh, lease agreement that we had in place, and that was operated, um, the Polar Charities, they operated the uh, concession stand for many years, and that lease expired in November of 2022, and that group has uh, decided not to continue, so that that is an opportunity to move, consider in the future. And finally, the American Legion. Um, in 1979, the Legion requested permission to install lighting at McKnight Field in exchange for use of the field free of charge indefinitely, and the council agreed to that request, and they passed Resolution 79078 that accepted the lights and indicated that the Legion can have free use of the field except for cleanup charges from then on. So 1979 to indefinitely. Can I pause you for a point of clarity? Sure. The Legion uses McKnight Field or the Legion uses Kunkel Field? Sorry, it was called McKnight. Uh, but when I say McKnight, I'm referring to Kunkel. Thank you. Good, good point. Okay, operational costs. So this is something that we were asked to, to take a look at to give council a better understanding of what it, what it takes to operate the facility and what it costs. So we, um, Ron and his team put together a annual cost for all of the materials like chalk, fertilizer, grass seed, Roundup, um, irrigation, mowing, et cetera, and kind of came up with a, a year value of all of those things. And then we divided that by field um, and then divided that by day of the of how many days there are in the summer, typically. And so just the maintenance and supplies cost about $102 per field per day. And that does not even touch the electric costs. So this I'm gonna struggle with, but I'm gonna do my best to try to explain it. So the use of the fields um, is a little bit more complicated because to use the fields, the customer must pay a demand charge, which is an additional fee for large utility users to maintain the constant constant supply of electricity. So when you factor in the demand charge um, for Kunkel Field specifically, that would be $733 a month. And that does not include the fees or the uh, just the rate charges. So if they're turning on the lights at all, that's what it's gonna cost for that month. And then in addition to that, then you have the use fees as well. So supplies are 
or two minutes or whatever, right. just to flip on the switch. For the month. Correct. 15 minutes yep. for the month. Correct. Oh, 15, okay. So moving forward, just to let you know, that the ball field rental rates that we have on the fee schedule now, they do not include these costs necessarily. And so this is what our fee schedule currently, um, we, what we collect for rentals is $75 per four hour time increment or $150 per tournament, which is renting the field for the entire day. Or if you want to have a midday drag or any kind of maintenance, then it would add another $300. And I think that would typically occur if there's going to be a, a tournament for the day. So we also looked at planning documents because, you know, that's very important to city planners. So when we looked at our comprehensive plan to see what it had to say about uh, the McKnight Field Complex, it did have two specific things. The first is that we should promote shared use of the park and open spaces wherever schools and parks are adjacent, such as McKnight and North High School. And the second thing is that we should continue to provide a high level of maintenance and make improvements as appropriate. And looking at the park improvement plan, that document recommends that we prepare a master plan for McKnight that includes a thorough assessment of the aging condition of existing buildings and facilities to give us a better understanding of the future replacement needs. And it should also consider the existing facility mix, um, the amenities out there, programming needs, and then what do the, what do the residents want to see? Cost estimate should also be included um, so that we can adequately budget for any improvements. So far, the master plan has not been prepared. There was $10,000 that was set aside for, for a master plan, but I think when that was considered uh, by the park board, it was more of a, a layout, and so I think that the master plan name is a little bit confusing. What it really is is what I described and not a layout, but it's a, a hard look at what is the facility, what do we want to see out there in the future. So for the discussion, I've got a couple of points just to get us started. Uh, so recommendations and some questions. So the first recommendation is to continue to comply with the HUD agreement like we've done. Um, we will continue to partner with the school district on coming up with a shared use agreement for the facilities, and we should prepare that community-wide park and rec master plan um, that looks at not just McDight, but all of the facilities throughout the community. And then things to consider in our discussion tonight is the future of the batting cages, um, the future of polar or the polar charity um, concession stand, are the current fee schedule rates appropriate, and what do we think about the donation of the scoreboard? And with that, I will ask questions, or have you ask me any questions, and I can stand here and keep this on, or I can sit down, whatever you prefer. One question, probably more towards you, Brian, is we met with the superintendent of the schools uh, last m Friday, and she was gonna get a list of what they thought the needs were gonna be. Have you received anything yet? Um, not from them, but we put a list together, uh, and we will have that to you. I apologize, I don't have that in front of me, but uh, we do have their uh, reservation schedule for the summer. Okay. Um, and it was extensive, so I mean, it, uh, we'll be looking at those rates and coming back with you guys with some more suggestions and what's acceptable to you guys. And she also mentioned, uh, with Superintendent Christine, that they are gonna be doing their tennis over at one of the newer schools. What's the name of the school? They, it's over in Maplewood. It, yeah, they already put a lot of money into that and re yep. refurbished those fields. So the, the tennis courts aren't, aren't needed for, for, for that position for our, the schools. They'll be one of the other ones with a brand new one. They said they couldn't, their, the way their policy is, they cannot invest money into land that they don't own. Yes. So that's why they didn't upgrade the so. tennis courts. So those were the couple of questions we had when we met on Friday. Question Can I that. ask a question? <laughs> so the school district cannot invest in land that they don't own? They can't invest in improvements on land they don't own. That for those, that was what she told us. Just makes me question the scoreboard, yeah. 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 Correct. Maybe donated or something? When, when you referenced ball fields and, and the schools, what fields is does that encompass, and what what does the high school use? 
of city land and do they have their own fields as well? That's where I, and Brandy, awesome job putting the packet together. There was a lot of history in there to, to, okay. to unpack. I got confused when it started talking about school fields and city fields and I don't know who uses what. Um, is it, can you guys hear me? All right. Yeah. Um, so the, the school district uses the boys baseball, the varsity baseball team um, and JV team use the Kunkel Field. The girls fast pitch softball use um, two of the fields on the McKnight Complex. So that, that is their home fields. They don't have a ball field on their school property for you know any of that. And then they used to use our tennis courts for their tennis team, but like Brandy said, they invested the money in John Glenn and that's where they play their varsity games there, JV. So, so girls fast pitch softball, I, I believe varsity, JV, and I believe maybe a ninth grade team. And then the boys, uh, baseball varsity or the boys baseball. Okay. So also use the the T ball court for practice on occasion too. Yeah, they'll they'll use that for practice, you know, overflow. But mostly that mostly the high school practices at that complex. Okay. So like Richardson has a ball field. That's considered a school ball field or a city ball field. That's that is a school ball field. So they maintain. Yes, they, Richardson has two ball fields. Uh, Cowan has three ball fields. Um, where else? Any other ones that we can think of? Harmony? Oh, yeah, Harmony. Um, Harmony has a, a baseball field. It is that under, well, it's under 622. It is. Okay. So Piggy, backing off of Tim's question, um, Tartan High School, do they have ball fields and own their own ball fields? They do. They have their own uh, full-size baseball field and a girls' fast pitch field on their property. Okay. okay. I know last year there was a concern, of course, this year with all the snow we have, that it took them to almost to the end of the season before they could even use our field because it was so, so wet out there. Correct. And we have a problem with that on quite a few years because of the drainage out there. Well, we do. I mean, they have a short time to get their games in, you know, in the in the spring before school ends. And, I mean, that complex is built on a swamp. I mean, it, it, it is. They filled in a swamp basically to make that complex. So it doesn't take much to, you know, make those fields unplayable. I mean, we, we do go to extreme lengths sometimes to make sure that, um, you know, we have to put those fields away in the in the fall ready to go because we don't have any time in the spring to do any kind of major project or even a minor project. We pretty much have to, when it, once it's dry enough to get out there where we can get the bases set and get the fields drug, you know, they're out there wanting to use them. I mean, they want to, if they have some dry spots mm -hmm. in the grass to use, they'll use that mm -hmm. just because it, you know, it, they have a short, short period of time to, to use them or to get their games in. Another thing we talked about too is that um, T-ball field. You said the last time it was signed out officially for any kind of games was like 2018. Is that correct? It was used last, but the high school really doesn't. They might use that to go take batting practice. I mean, that's not their primary field that they would use. Um, there's a fast pitch group over the summer that used it, and I'm not sure the organization that put you know that who organized that or had that together, but. They practice on there a lot. There's a tournament that they use the whole complex down there, and they use that field five or t-ball field as uh, they, they played some games on that for some overflow. So that was for like a, a three or four day weekend tournament. And then there was one other night that we prepped the field for actual uh, actually a game. Other than that, it was used for practices in 2022, and then I think 2018 through 2021. Um, we didn't prep it at all for anything. There was nothing scheduled or on it for, at, at all. So, And so does that mean that the, they're warming up or practicing out in the um, that field without any maintenance? Yes, yes, 
pretty much. Yep. Yeah. And normal mowing, of course. Yeah, yeah. We you know we mow it. We, we irrigate it. That's an irrigated field too. So you know we make sure that the grass is. We fertilize it. You know to keep it the best that we can. We drag that field randomly, just to keep the grass from growing in it. Um, but it's not something that you know it's done every single day. Um, if on our field maintenance calendar that we have, um, like the, that group, they gave us their schedule, and basically on our field maintenance calendar it said practice, no maintenance needed. Um, so that's, like I said, we just kind of drag it once a week just to keep the weeds out of it. In regards to the operational costs, I don't believe I saw labor in there. Um, I, was there, I think there was labor in there. 58 an hour? Yeah, we assumed one hour uh, of time at $58 an hour. So that would be for one field. And, you know, to, when, when I was trying to come up with how I was going to break these costs down, it's really hard because I, it's basically what I did with the whole thing is, hey, this is what we have to do whether the fields are used or not, fertilize it, irrigate it, mow it. Um, and then I just had that hourly charge, so hey, it'd take an hour to prep a field. And then I took chalk, what we paid for chalk for a year, what we paid for fertilizer for a year for there, and just broke it down to a daily cost. Say, hey, it costs $4 a day to have fertilizer down there, or chalk down there, or whatever. Or the and you are. all are chalking the lines? We, we chalk the lines, we paint, so there's paint in there. We paint the outfield lines, because they're on grass. We chalk the infield lines. Um, so when there's adult softball down there versus girls fast pitch softball, there's three different base lengths that mm -hmm. are out there. So if the girls use it on a Monday night and they have their games on it and we have something and they don't use it on Tuesday night and we have adult softball on there Tuesday night, um, the bases are longer. They're at 70 feet. The girls' bases are at 60 feet. Mm -hmm. um, the girls have uh, used this. There's three different pitching mounds out there, which we have. They're installed permanently. But the girls have a circle that we yeah, that needs to be chalked around the, the pitching mound. The girls have batter's boxes that they need to have chalked in there. Adult softball, we just chalk straight lines down. There's no batter's box boxes or you know anything like that. So it, anything different than girls softball on there, you know, it has to be adjusted. And we've had you know, there's been nights where. There's girls softball, and then there's adult softball after. So we have to have a guy standing by. Normally we have about a half hour to get in there, switch the fields over to adult softball, drag them, rechalk them. Um, so that you know that requires some overtime sometimes to to take care of that. So nobody from the district does any of that, but you, but the city. No, the city does it now. Just so you guys have some background. Uh, now, I, when I started here, I don't know, 15, 16 years ago. Just as a maintenance guy, um, I was doing the fields. And when the high school was using our fields, they, their crews came and prepped all, their fi all the fields, our fields, for their games. Mm -hmm. um, and I believe, I believe it was that first year that I was here, halfway through the season, um, their maintenance guy came up to me and said, hey, I guess we're not doing it anymore. You guys are doing it. Um, and I believe that was because how they were taking care of the fields. Now, again, I wasn't in any position to know the, the backstories of this. I was just out there, and a guy handed me, hey, here's some batter's boxes, the sizes, and I'm out of here. So, um, and I believe the backstory was is that how they were taking care of the fields, they were kind of, it wasn't up to probably the standards that they should have been. It was my understanding. Now, I, again, this is all just hearsay, so I don't know this for sure, but... From that point on, we took care. We took care of them, you know, prepping those fields. So, it's kind of a catch twenty two on that because if we got to go down there and they're not, they're doing a subpar, you know, maintenance on what the fields are, <clears throat> and you know that's be dragging egg lime out into the grass, you know, hitting our sprinkler heads or whatever it might be. So I be and I believe in our field maintenance agreement that we're working on with the school district, and I think it was in there prior to the, us working on this too, is that the city would take care of all their field stuff. I mean, we take care of our the fields that we own, the school district would take care of the fields that they own. And when I started here too, we had the NSPAA was big, there, everything was going on. We used Cowern, 
we used Harmony, we used Richardson, and we used Webster. So we went and we would do like 15 fields a day is what we would prep on a daily basis using the school district fields because we needed them. We didn't have enough fields for all the, the, the ball that was going on. But like Brandy said, we don't have any of that anymore. So I mean, we don't need, there's no use, need for us to use any of the school district fields. So then question for the city, and Brian, well, it's like you would know this, or Brandy, did we rent those fields from the schools? Sorry, did we rent? Did we pay for those school spaces? In the past couple of years. When, um, and. Well, histo historically, I wasn't able to find any records of payments except for um, last year, the year before. We did have, we were the conduit for people that were from outside of the city to rent school facilities. We've stopped that practice now. And in those instances, they didn't get charged for the use of the field, but we were charged a, a transaction fee of $25. Back in the, back in the day, I believe there it was just kind of a, hey, you use our fields, we use your fields. Again, I don't have any proof of that because I was just a maintenance guy then. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I don't know that there was any money exchanged or we had to rent their fields. And last year, we did use the school district. We used Cowan Fields because of an organization that came up, um, a youth baseball group, a, a group of guys got together to start a, a youth baseball because their kids were like, hey, we have no place to play in North St. Paul. So I, you know, I believe some of these people got together and they wanted to use Cowan Fields because there's three fields there. You know, it could be in one area, and they could kind of manage it better there. So that's where we actually went over and prepped their fields. Mm -hmm. um, we used Cowan Fields last year, and I believe that's where that $25 fee came in, registration fee, and I don't know if that was per night or one time a year or, or what. I, I don't know what that was. Oh, that fee was just for the one time that it took for Lisa to make the phone call to reserve the fields. Oh. Yep. Okay. So the pictures clearly show that there needs to be maintenance on that. Circling back to the school using it, the city caring for these um, fields, who are we obtaining a certificate of insurance from the city to utilize these fields and the tennis courts as well? If they are, and we have our certificate of insurance, if somebody gets hurt, who is liable and what property is liable for that? Is the city li held liable for that because of the fact that it hasn't been upkept? Is district liable for the individuals that are utilizing it? That's where my concerns would be on that level. I mean, I'm yeah. just I'm just talking to you directly, not yeah, like yeah, you're I'm like, responsible. I, 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 no, I'm sorry. I believe These that are they, I, that I believe to in some of the conversations. Again, this is my first year being involved with any of these conversations, but from what I gather is that that is they are uh, given proof of insurance. I believe mm -hmm. there is language that says something about that in there, like, "Hey, you're using our fields; it's on you." Yeah, there is language regarding insurance in the in the agreement. Um, whether or not we have that on in, in our records, I'd have to double check and, and find it. That's definitely something we're going to want to look at, make sure we have record of it. The biggest concern on a park end, though, too, is because they're utilizing the services, and it, we are required to maintain the, those areas. It is now, it falls on the city because we have not maintained them. So if something happens, you, we, it would, I'm not a servant, I am not an insurance expert, but I can easily say that because we have not maintained it, that we would probably be liable for that situation. Are, are you talking about the tennis courts specifically? Yeah, I, the pictures that you had shown and yeah. I mean, even if there were, gosh. Yeah, I, there, the school district is not reserving the tennis courts mm -hmm. and I don't even know if anybody is using them, are they locked? No. 
Oh, I've read in the packet. Unusable. I think it's no longer in use. We have a lock, though. No, there's not. We don't put the nets up. I mean, it's just a uh, vacant tennis court right we now. We pull the fences down around them yet? We the did fences not. Fences are still up? Okay. Yep. It sounds like there is um, a big need for for um, this, the school district to utilize the fields, whether it's Kunkel fields or the softball fields, and sometimes that um, what, what do they call it the t ball the t ball um, um, field as well. And so, with that said, I mean, you know, what kind of either programming can we pull in to make it worth it? Or is there something um, we can think about in terms of um, looking at what the amenities are now? Does that make sense? Well, the school district uses, what, a month and a half, probably, is what they get out of it on a normal year. <laughs> Included is an amendment to the packet that went out. Uh, there's another attachment in there that shows for the past three years the reservations of all the different organizations for all of the fields for the entire summer. So it gives you a grand total of how many times each field was rented for um, the date and and who was renting them. Yeah, normally whenever school, I mean, the, as soon as they can get on the fields in the spring, the school, till basically school is out is when they, and. I believe I can't. I can't remember if they can have playoffs if they make it to the playoffs. If that's after school or if that has to be before school ends. But basically, once school is done, um, they're, they're done using the fields. Well, it looks like they were. If it was a a decent spring, uh, it looks like the March thirteenth they would have started up there. Yeah, I think they had that scheduled for this year, yep. March thirteenth. And but it looks like it goes. There might down. be a little snow on the field still. Yeah, so they had wishful thinking this year. We all do. Yeah, it looks like the 17th of May is the last time they have the Kunkel. But looks like the softball fields go on a little bit till June 2nd. <clears throat> And we do not have any mounds, right, over at that. Okay. Yes, on the in the complex, that the four fields or the pinwheel, there's no pitching mounds on there. That's basically um, softball, slow pitch, fast pitch. Um, I know that the NSPA used that when they got smaller. They could kind of run all their different programs up there. Um, any of the youth baseball, they could um, utilize. Casey Lake, Lower Casey or Casey One has a mound on it, and Upper Casey, which is a little bit smaller field, but it's a baseball field, and that has a smaller pitching mound on it too. I know we're talking about uh, McKnight Complex, but um, how much did you do at Casey last year as far as field prep? Well, that same group that when I was talking about using the group of guys that got that used softball together, um, I believe, and, and don't quote me on this, but I think it's on the field maintenance calendar for last year. I mean, I would say there was maybe three times a week, two or three times a week, we prepped that field down there. And there's four fields at KC? There's KC one and two. Yep. It, there's four fields total down there. Um, the two main fields are one and two is what, what they use. Um, field one, um, uh, what's his name? Jerry Bell. Jerry Bell, yeah. Jerry Bell from the Twins. I think he was the president of the Twins for a long time. He got some money from a Twins fund down there, and that was redone, I don't know, maybe three, four years ago, maybe five years ago. Um, I was but, just curious to see what kind of a – I know it's a little bit off topic – to see what kind of revenue or what kind of events we had down there as well. As yeah, but that group used that. And prior to that, there was, an, there was another, like a um, – a baseball traveling baseball group that for North St. Paul I mean, they, there were some people from North St. Paul but they just got a group of kids together and they used it prior to that yeah. you gave me a tour of the facility on Thursday last Thursday thank you so I was able to yeah. walk around we went into the concession area we still don't know who owns all the equipment in there there was nothing that really divided up so nobody has an idea of all the machines in there and different things as far as for that building too going forward Of 
question over there? Yeah, I'm just looking at um, the ball field reservations, and I see um, outside of the school district, there are um, three different organizations reserving the field, 3M, Minnesota Magic, and the Legion. So just to clarify, is the Legion is not um, paying for their use? No. And the baseball field, the, the Legion field, just so everyone knows, that ball field is kind of like a, it's a premier ball field. It's a really nice field. Um, the Legion over the years have take, has taken really great care of it. There is Ron Adams that used to be kind of, I think he was the coach down there for a, a long time, 20, 25 years or something. He was very uh, particular about that field. He, you know, always there's a cart they used to own a cart down there we have a cart down there also um because th their cart that they had it was really old and kind of dangerous so um we, we got rid of that we purchased a new one a couple of years ago and we put our older one down there but they used to after their games they would drag the fields out and kind of you know, we tarp the mounds. The mounds are made out of clay. The mound is made out of clay down there. The batter's boxes have clay in them down there. So it's a totally different field than one of the softball fields, and it, it, it's like a high maintenance field. Um, so the Legion always did a great job with. Uh, they're like, hey, we'll help you out doing this. You know, so after the games, they'd put the fields away good. You know, we'd go down and prep the fields for them when we got the the schedule for you know what their schedule was, but. Really, the only people that use that field are the high, the high school uses it in the spring. In the summertime, the Legion baseball team uses it, and the VFW baseball team uses it. And I don't know if there was a I – I think the last couple of years, again, don't quote me on this, but I think the VFW, they, they didn't have a team. I don't know if there was funding for it or if they didn't have the kids for it, but normally there was – and then were basically – the the people that use that field. That field was never rented out to just anybody to go to go use it. I mean, I refer to it as a Legion field because that's kind of, you know, what it is, but it, or how I look at it. Yeah, so. Thank you. We um, looked, we found that the Legion had some, some agreement when it came to the field itself. As far as that, we so that's one section of what we need to look at. Is and the part of that is just they have to take care of cleanup and things like that, but they don't pay for the for the um, field rental itself. Is what is that correct, Ryan? Okay. So that's one piece of the puzzle because they we did find that agreement. Um, is the Legion able to take care of their own chalking, so we don't have to have city resources do that? Do you? Th I would think being they're a high grade team and. They have, uh, I would think they'd be able to take care of that part themselves, and then we would charge rent for anybody that uses the softball fields so we can maintain those. I mean, that could work. They're, I mean, they're going to need the right person, yep. you know, on. But nobody plays their, on that but them, nope. so if they screw up, they're screwing themselves up. Sure. Yeah. I, yeah, I mean, if. But the, the other one, we rent out to other people, so is what I'm saying. Is yes, that. yes. So there's a, yeah. The group that uses that is they're pretty specific yes. on that. Yeah, you know, yeah. We. Yeah. I, I would add that we wouldn't restrict the use of that field to just the legion, though. If somebody wants to rent it, it will be reserved. Well, we have. To, I don't know. They provided the lighting, the booth, and stuff like that. That's kind of a different avenue, I think, compared to the regular fields themselves. Do we own the land? Yes, it and was the land that was public. purchased with the HUD money. Well, they yes. well for public pur they public know? purpose. It's a donation. Did they donate? Uh, okay. Well, the, le the Legion donated the lighting, and that is all. Okay. Cause well, it's, that's all that I have record of. They, were, they donated land, too, so. Uh, no, the land was from a grant from, from HUD, so the, the federal government. And so with that grant, there are specific uh, restrictions on the f perpetual use of that. It has to remain open to the public um, as, as open space or recreation. So that's why the boundary of that, which we don't have access to at this minute, is pretty important because we can never take it out of recreational use without permission from HUD. Sure. And I would think we'd look at that as a different rental agreement then as far as the pricing because that's a, a different style field maybe. Potentially, yeah. Um, but as it stands, we, if anybody wants to rent the field that's not the school district or the Legion, they would rent it for 75 bucks 
um, for four-hour increments. Just Has that been included as Kunkel as part of that agreement for $75? Was that specific? The, the 75? I haven't heard anything except for the softball fields for the 75 bucks. So that's well, why I'm asking the question. That, that the $75 is for the, um, it's per the fee schedule. So that was adopted um, back in December. So the fee schedule is everything that under the sun that somebody might have to pay the city for, like a building permit, for example, uh, re reservations for park shelters, for example, or the or the ball fields. So the seventy-five dollars is any of the fields. Um, In that for, for four-hour increment. Do you have any idea how the last council came up with that number? I don't know that it was the council necessarily that came up with it. Maybe maybe um, there's some Department guidance here, but or somebody or, or general. Isn't it generally staffing staff kind of do a, a look yeah, at I that? Yeah, I can address that. Okay. Um, so, yeah, it was a group effort. So we would get input from Public Works and Electric to pull together the costs that they have for those fields. Um, and they came up, well, what the final was for the $75 charge, that's actually probably about half of what the cost is to actually do it. Um, but we thought, you know, it's a public good. It's for the kids in our city and our community. Um, so we felt that was an appropriate price at the time. When you talk about residential, non-residential, or anything like that, just a flat fee is what it was pretty much looked at? Uh, no, historically it, it was separated out, correct, Ron, with that? Uh, yeah, I, I, again, I wasn't involved I mean, with coming up with the numbers, but if just from hearsay and what I heard, I, just to echo what Brian said, is that I, I believe that, not, I want to say the number is 150 to $60 or something per field prep and and I think they had discussion about it and talked about it, and they're like, "That's crazy! It's too much money. They can't, people can't afford it, or the organizations can't afford it." So I think they cut it in half. And and again, I don't know how that number was, you know, come up with. But but there was a separation between um, residential, non-residential, um, or nonprofit. Can you as far as the community charges. based? organizations I think that probably over the years there was something residential versus non-residential I'm just guessing based on the, the users of of the fields and the community center for example I know that when there was the community center membership fees there was resident versus non-resident so I would imagine I don't know for sure that it could have been that way in past fee schedules for the, for the field rentals um, it's certainly a discussion that we could have now. There's no reason why we couldn't modify the fee schedule to to benefit residents versus non-residents. Appreciate the information where it came from. I was just curious. If I may, we are talking a lot about um, the cost of things, and I see that 3M is well represented on the schedule. Mm -hmm. I would like for us to kind of entertain a kind of a public part private partnership there. I think that is something worth investigating um, if, if we want to continue to invest in these fields, um, and that might be helpful. Yeah, we learned that from the one we took the tour of, of Conway, mm -hmm. the dedications yeah. and things like that. Very doable. Mm -hmm. Then the tennis courts, First, we were looking at that and the, the fees, or um, the, the conditions. So, you know, is there any anything else that came up with that as far as? Uh, no, that that the, there's two sets of ten, there's two sets of tennis courts which have three tennis courts in each one, and the the main I guess the ones if you drove into the parking lot that are directly to the north of all well, I. There's a set of tennis courts down there that are, they're just in disrepair. I mean, the fences, someone stole all the hardware off of them and replaced the hardware, I think, two times on it, and someone keeps stealing the hardware off it just to keep the poles from falling down, and they're kind of all over the place. Um, the the courts are, like I said, we put Roundup on them because the grass grows through them, and I mean, they're just, they're, they're shot. And the fencing looks terrible because all the hardware is gone again and the poles are hanging. You know, my opinion, we should take them, that fencing down. And, you know, it, we have some money this year to redo that parking lot down there. But, I mean, it wouldn't be enough to, I don't believe, if we just even paved over that whole tennis court area that's there right now. There's a whole other set of tennis courts uh, back uh, further to the west um, that, they're not great either. They're not 
nearly as bad as these ones, but I think last year we only put up one or two nets in there because there's some big cracks and it, it needs, it's, it's really kind of dangerous probably to, to play out there with those. Um, but the one set of courts, I mean, I'd like to do something to make it look a little better. I think at this point, the the courts, the tennis courts, are not in use. There, there is not any plan to use them or reserve them. They're they're just kind of sitting, mothballed at the moment. Yeah. Um, future considerations, I think, will come forward as we do like a, a system wide recreational plan, and that will take a little bit of time and some outreach. Know that uh, the one set was really bad taking the fence down from that but is there any other things until we did get that far I know there was some outdoor storage maybe we talked about there we could be able to fence in some some of the things that the city has troubles storing right now and looking into that um, and speaking with Brandy as well it's it's not zoned for that and we don't know that it was even an allowable use when with the HUD situation that we have but we're still looking into it even temporary uh, we We'd have to change the zoning for one, but um, we'd have to look at the wording on it. All right. Okay. That's new information. Yeah, there are park is. benches. It is. Big, long yeah. park benches. <laughs> so then I would probably take them all down, or at least lock them up so people can't get in there. Yeah, and get hurt. No, it's, I mean, the, the, uh, my opinion, the tennis courts, <coughs> everything just needs to be pulled out and leveled, and there's nothing really left to be used. So the other part, we gonna go to the batting cages. Yes, thank you. Batting cages, and then the kind of the middle of the where the cooking or the concession is is pretty much a, kind of a dead issue right now because nobody stepped up to say, hey, we want to run that or can we rent that from the city. So we'll just worry about that one. But the batting cages themselves, it sounds like we need to address that as far as the how long the lease has been and it's gone on quite a few years after the, the original agreement. Yep, 15 year lease originally. Um, at the end of that, they uh, renegotiated for a 10 year extension on that. Um, that was just a one time fee of $1 for them to be there for those 10 years. They took care of all the expenses. The city doesn't take any um, or pay for any expenses through the building. Um, but at the end of that, that'll be up this uh, June. And so we need to decide, do you want to extend it? If you want to extend it for how long? Um, do you want to keep it at a one dollar? Do you, you know, so we have a lot of information that we could. We own the building. We own the building. It was closed when I was there with Ron, so I never seen it. Do we know? Um, they do have online uh, pictures in there, seen the inside of it, but uh, yeah, there. Or is the roof um, age and is it original? Everything original on the thing. The uh, furnace machine? has been replaced twice. The roof has been replaced twice. Um, so that part is good, and it's been replaced since the hail that we saw last May. So that's good. It is. Mm -hmm. There has been upkeeps. They've done inspections on it before where they've updated the railing and a few other things on the building as well. So. Do you know what kind of usage it gets? For the, like how many people they're, they're serving? Uh, we spoke with uh, Dennis Bartholomew, uh, who will speak later at the council meeting, but uh, he was saying that this time of year, like on weekends, they could get 500 to 1,000 people in and out of there um, in the batting cages during a day. Paying or like parents Correct. coming? Okay. Nope. Nope. Taking one minor step back um, to what Council Member Wong said, just out of curiosity, if we found a partner um, for any of these facilities, I would be curious if we found a wonderful donor, what the cost would be to convert um, those old dilapidated tennis courts to the pickleball courts just to have a number in the back of our head where let's say 3M wanted to step up and fund these just to have a number in the back of our head so we could talk apples, apples would kind of be nice in, in my thinking. We can look into that. You'd be starting over. You'd be taking it out and starting over and rebuilding it, but we can look into that, yes. I think the master plan for the parks would be really informative to see what kind of amenities would need to be there. Of course, pickleball is super popular at the moment, so that could be extremely likely. But I do look forward to that master plan. I think soccer is very popular around too, so we have, don't have much when it comes to soccer either. So it seems to be quite a bit compared to, to some of the other, to the baseball over the years. Mm -hmm. 
As for myself, um, I'm thinking that the batting cages at this point in time is an asset um, if they're bringing that many folks in to recreate. Um, in terms of a lease extension, what that looks like, I'm considering a, a shorter lease just because we do have a master plan potentially coming. So um, to be mindful of that, so maybe like on a year-to-year -year or year to two year basis would be my my thinking. How big is the, the batting cage of scar square feet? Do we know? I'm sorry, I don't know that off the top of my okay. head. And as for the batting cages, do residents get a different rate there or is that kind of like a across the board? These are going to be great questions to ask Dennis and okay. our company. <laughs> <laughs> yes. My apologies. Thanks. Anything else anybody wants to? I think we kind of. And as far as, um, if, I, if you don't mind, uh, moving on to the concession stands themselves, I mean, we could take it to, um, you know, put it out in RFP. We could speak to some agencies around town that might have the ability to do something like that. Um, or next steps, if you'd like that. Traffic-wise, how much? We got to find out what we own and what we don't own too up there first. I think part of it too. And, and that gentleman did reach out, um, and I was waiting to find out some information before we met with them to go over the exact piece of equipment. But that will be happening soon. Does the high school have like a? Booster Club or something like that? That was an idea. The BFW was an idea. We have a foundation that we were looking at. Um, so there were some other options, but uh, we haven't reached out yet. Yeah. Perhaps an RFP would be appropriate. The struggle with a lot of school functions is it's run during the summer. Mm -hmm. You know, North High used to have DECA, which used to run the coffee shop at the community center. Mm -hmm. That was really run during the yeah. school year. So, um, and again, I understand that there's the, the, you know, it was like a dollar lease or whatever, and there was, um, I've heard numbers anywhere from forty to $60,000 a year generated in, um, in revenues f from that. Um, if we put it out for RP, I would like to see it maybe be $2. <laughs> <laughs> Double our money, we'll start low, but... Um, there's money generated, there's money earned, depending on where it goes. The city also has expenses to, to the building as well that, again, parks don't pay for themselves, and, but it would like to see where we can make a slightly larger return. I'd, I'd like to see that part of it put into consideration. Could that be a percentage well, or something? Of some, the, some, yeah, yeah, nothing. It's reinvested back yep. into the field or, yep. yes. okay. Leery of a dollar agreements on anything because it's just, you know, we have a lot of expenses to be able to, to keep up things and be able to make it whole, but still be able to provide for the community and some charities. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, it's hard to go down that road for me. The 40 to 60 number is was kind of in the heyday of it over there. I'm and, sure it was. And nowadays, it's people are really having issues with trying to get volunteers to show up them, at them. The firefighters had it for a while. They did. And then, then it went down to. Yep, yep, yep. Staff, where do you want us to go? Um, I think staff, I mean, as, as council, where do you want us to go? I apologize. No, I think we have some good direction, um, RFP for that. Um, you guys will still be able to hear some more input for the batting cages this evening. And then... Um, as far as fields? And, well, the fields, um, just to make... With uh, the Legion... 75, yep, yeah, that has been passed by council last November, I believe it was. Um, so unless you guys come up with another resolution, it, that's where we will be at. Um, and it is as Legions has their, their, their contract. Their agreement. So I think we have to stick with that even in my mind because it's, it was there, but I think they have to take care of their own field. Okay. And then the cleanup. Oh, everybody thinks about that. 
Is there a written agreement? There's a written agreement from Mayor 1979 that they donated. I looked it up because it was 50,000 for the lights. So I, 1979, so I looked up and a house cost 63,000 in 1979. So just to kind of get an idea what the value of $50,000 worth of lights were compared to nowadays. So they, there was that agreement there and it was going forward, that type of thing. So um, it was a lifetime, what's considered a lifetime. That's why I don't like these contracts where we, and anything where we have such open-endedness. And if, don't mean to put you on the spot there, Soren, but. I was gonna ask. No, oh, yeah. Uh, no, Brandy and I talked about this a little bit and we looked into it. Um, you know, the, you can enter into, there's some technical nuances on this. You can enter into some forever contracts. Um, it depends on the wording. What you have that candidly is just plain as day is an intention for it to be forever. Um, and that was kind of the deal that was cut with the city at the time. And so I think there's the issue of sort of a pragmatic aspect to it. It says what it says. Um, and you did get the lights. We're still using the lights. Um, I think we have arguments to suggest that, you know, contracts that are forever are disfavored. But this was a resolution by the city. You accepted the lights. They're still being used. Um, so if we were to want to walk away from it, I think we'd have to have some more involved discussions on that. But in, ge in general, the, the resolution is pretty clear. Yeah. And it was good faith on both yeah. sides. So for me, I would think we would be able to continue with that, but just have them take over the, the chalking and not, you know, like they had it before. And all of a sudden, some, somebody handed you the equipment and said, here, you're in charge of fields now, goodbye. So I think if that would, and plus it was in the agreement too that they would do any kind of cleanup. So there is written language for that as well. You, you would like that in moving forward to, to do it that way? Do we need to vote on something like that, Soren, or? No, I, I think what we can do is, Brian, if you have direction, I mean, there's an opportunity to reapproach them and just talk about kind of, it's something we've looked at, the agreement or the resolution was done in 79. We'd like to clarify some things. It's been a while. My lawyer math is failing me at the moment, but <laughs> it's been a while. 60, 70 years if I round up, Tim. You, know. <laughs> you don't want the bill that much, right, do you? Yeah. <laughs> no. um, but I do, I think it is a tricky situation because in general, there are legal and technical arguments to say that, look, the foreverness of it is presumptively invalid. Um, I think what you have to just purely deal with is the, the language on that resolution is clear. As a governmental entity, you accepted the lights. You've been using the space. That's been the deal. Do you want to create some sort of technical argument to get out of it? to a community partner. I think they're willing to work with what the people that have reached out to me, everybody's willing to work with what we have. So I don't think it has to be anything like that in my opinion, but if they will pitch in and get some of the cost for some of the, you know, the maintenance as far as the chalk and we'll mow like we always mow. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's not gonna change because if Kunkel wasn't there, you would still have to mow. Otherwise we'd look like Hillcrest Golf Course. <laughs> So there's things that, as owners of property, we have to do no matter what. It's the above and beyond, in my mind, hey, let's work together on it. Anybody, does that sound okay? I think it's worth engaging in the conversation if, if that's how people feel, yeah. Mm -hmm. They've been good to the community and we just, I just wanna make sure that we're fair. We're not gonna give it away, but we're gonna be fair. We have good direction from you guys, so I think with regards to time, we could wrap that up. All right, thank you so much. Thank you. All right, I'm gonna call, do I have to do anything? Because I do this wrong every time. Just adjourn the meeting, do I call for to adjourn the meeting? Um, Motion to adjourn the meeting, sorry. Let's see, I did it wrong. Here. Second. All right, all in favor, say aye. 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 Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that, uh, especially after.
Let's do the Pledge of Allegiance, please. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible. I'm sure. <laughs> We're professionals. All right. Oh, that's back. Take roll, please. Yeah. Council Member Cole. Here. Council Member Schwer. Here. Council Member Wong. Here. Council Member Nordby. Here. And Mayor Mongi. Here. Thank you so much. Get a motion to adopt the agenda for tonight. So moved. So moved by Council Member Cole. Second. Second by Council Member Wong. All in favor? Say aye. 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 Presentations. Ramsey County Food Scrap Pilot Program. Welcome. Appreciate you coming up, Victoria. Are you evening? I assume this is where I'm supposed to be. <laughs> okay. You're at the uh, good evening. I'm Victoria Reinhart, Ramsey County Commissioner. I represent District 7 on the County Board, um, and that is all of the city of North St. Paul, all of White Bear Lake, and all of the city of Maplewood. And I'm really pleased to be here tonight. My background is actually in the environmental field, specifically in garbage, um, going back to the mid-'80s, actually, when the Recycling and Energy Center was... Uh, put together in response to state statute mandating that no unprocessed waste go into landfills by night. With, um, by 1990, there would be no more unprocessed waste going into landfills. So we see how that worked. Not well, but um, the fact of the matter is counties are the only level of government that are actually mandated to deal with garbage across the state. And so Ramsey and Washington counties in the early 1980s formed a partnership that is not only still in effect today, but much stronger than it was even when it began. Because at that point, it was just about the facility trying to make sure that we could um, get the refuse-derived fuel out of that facility. And so I'm going to skip all of the, the stuff in between here because we decided um, that we needed to do more in order to achieve the environmental goals, because that's what it was about. It wasn't just a mandate, it was about the environmental goals that we wanted to achieve. Um, and that was before people were talking about climate change, or at least in any uh, real conversation about it, but we wanted to do the right thing. And so we formed that this partnership. We decided then in 20, well, and Michael and Sam can tell you for sure, but I think it was 2017, is that right? 2016, all right. Um, we had the opportunity to figure out what we could do, and we bought the facility after much, much consideration, the Recycling and Energy Center in Newport. And so we've got two counties wide working together and truly working in a partnership with uh, nonprofits, with the businesses, um, and trying to really make sure that we were getting as much waste um, out of the landfill, out of processing even as we possibly could because we decided at the very beginning of that that we were going to do more than just chop it up and send it to Excel and have them burn it. That's not what we wanted to do, but that is part of the waste management hierarchy as they call it. So we made a, we made a commitment at that point to make sure that we could work, and I'm not going to get into all of the details of this because I really love this <laughs> and, and what we can do as a positive thing because everybody Everybody produces garbage. And so everybody can have an impact on what happens with that and the effect on the environment in future generations. And that's why I'm so passionate about this area. But we said we're going to um, figure out what else we can do. And part of that was, what do you do with organics? What do you do with the recyclables that end up in the waste stream? What can you do um, that will reduce the carbon footprint? And that goes to anaerobic digestion, and it goes to um, uh, uh, turning it into gas and using it uh, for uh, fuel. And that's, what that, that's the journey we're on today. And one of those things is in the organics area. And I'm going to let the real professionals on this come up and explain what we're doing, but I am so thrilled. There are four communities where a portion of the communities are, are entering into this organics uh, recycling uh, pilot project. Again, this is going to roll out to two counties wide. It's the first in the nation to do something like this. Um, and then I will let them explain what the process is, but it's pulling out the 
the organics, and we needed to have two communities in Ramsey County and two in Washington County, a portion of the cities. And North St. Paul has stepped up to the plate, and we have worked with uh, your staff here to have that happen here. So you're part of the very beginning of what I think is a change in the way we deal with our garbage. So I will turn it over to Michael Reed, and you'll get the full experience of it. And we also have other folks here that can, and Sam Hall will be talking, and we can um, then we can answer any questions that you have. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, Michael Reed with Ramsey County, and I'm a division manager there working with uh, recycling and energy, and I'm going to turn it over to one of our professionals here. Sam Hansen, who is our joint activities manager, is going to present on the program, the pilot program. And we also have uh, Jennifer Winmore. She's with Ramsey County, and uh, she's got a, uh, a heavy involvement in this program as well. It's a collaborative effort between Ramsey, Washington staff, and also recycling and energy staff. We're very excited about it. I'll stop talking and turn it over to uh, Sam Hansen. I apologize. <laughs> there are too many Sams at the <laughs> We do have three different Sams on staff at RME, and two of them are Sam H. So it happens a lot, don't worry. <laughs> and she can point the finger to somebody, it's easier. We get a lot of each other's emails. So give me a second while this hopefully loads. Oh, well, look at that. That was easy. Great. So, uh, Mr. Mayor, Council Members, thanks for having us today. So I'm, I'm going to keep things pretty high level, uh, but just give a real quick overview of what this new program is and then what to expect as being a, a pilot community in the program. Um, and uh, Jennifer here has some of the sample bags, so if I'll have her pass it out so you can see the bags that we're talking about, and I'll jump into some of the, the details. Um, so like what was mentioned, we're here today to talk about this new residential recycling program. It's been years in the making, and we're about to launch a really small-scale pilot of the program, so I'm just going to talk a little bit about what to expect. And we're calling it the Food Scraps Pickup Program because it'll do exactly that. Um, it's going to give residents a really convenient way to have their food waste picked up from their home and then have it uh, go to a facility where it gets composted. And eventually this will be available for every resident in both counties, Ramsey and Washington County. Um, and how it'll work, this is a, a very simple uh, diagram of how it'll work. There's a lot of things behind the scene, but basically residents who sign up, they'll get bags delivered to their house. They use those bags, collect their food scraps. When the bag is full, they tie those bags. Those are samples of, of what we'll be using. Tie those bags up, put them into their, tra their existing trash receptacle, so their house dumpster trash bin that's outside. Um, the hauler that picks up their trash comes and picks that up. It eventually works its way, its way all the way down to the r &E facility that's down in Newport, Minnesota, that Commissioner Reinhardt said is, has been purchased by the two counties back in 2016. And there we have a whole bunch of new equipment and processes that uh, mechanically finds those bags, separates them out, and then those bags will get sent to commercial compost facilities where it gets turned into valuable compost. So again, that sounds very simple and you know, four, four circles on the screen, there's a lot more behind the scenes, but we're trying to make it as easy as possible for residents to understand how it works and then be able to participate. Um, and the, the reason that this program is possible is because of those bags. So they may look very similar to the compost bags that you may see at the store, they may feel very similar, but they've been specifically engineered to be thicker and more durable so that they can withstand that journey in the trash hauler's truck um, from curbside all the way to the RE facility. Um, and some of this I already covered, but a few reminders. So this will be a free program for residents. It will be voluntary, so it's, it's up to residents if they want to sign up or not. Um, and then we're trying to make it as convenient as possible. So we'll be sending those bags direct to the, to the homes. Um, you have the 13-gallon bag that's in front of you there. We also have a smaller bag, so there are going to be some options based on how uh, families want to collect food, food scraps at home. Um, and then we're also providing, we're developing a lot of different resources, you know, print uh, materials, website materials, FAQs, all of that in a variety of different languages, including the customer service line, just to, again, try to make it as accessible to anybody. So if you have questions, call this number, visit the website. We have 
uh, printouts and handouts, um, trying to, again, make sure that it's very clear what to do and what the end goal is for this program. And so, since, as was mentioned, this will eventually be available to every resident in the two counties, over 800,000 residents. Um, before we jump to that, we wanna start smaller. There's, this has been years in the making and we have a lot of great talented people that have been planning all of the details, but we wanna test some of those details before we open it up to the entirety of the two counties. So we are starting um, here in just a couple weeks. Early April, we'll be launching what we're calling a pilot. Um, it'll include up to 2,200 eligible households in the four communities that are listed here. And the star on the map represents roughly where those areas are, and I'll show where North St. Paul is in in a, in a minute. Um, again, trying to, to focus in some really targeted areas to test some of the resources that we've developed, make sure that we have all of all the bugs worked out, um, and then as we make changes and improve, then start to roll it out to more and more residents, more communities around the two counties. And specifically for North St. Paul, the area in green on this map represents uh, the area where it'll be available. So just kind of across the street here um, between uh, Century and 7th Avenue and the bottom border is 2nd Avenue, if you can read that tiny print. Um, so this area has about 455 eligible households and it's a good mix of single family home, multi unit buildings, because we want to test a lot of different factors and make sure, again, this is available and accessible to anybody, regardless of your housing situation. Um, and we're going to uh, be rolling it out there starting in a couple weeks, and then also doing a lot of engagement work with the, the families, the, the individuals that sign up to be a part of the program to understand what's working, what's not, um, so that we can then iterate and improve and, and advance the program as we launch it to other areas. Um, and how, how are we gonna do this? Since it is voluntary, uh, it's, it's gonna be available to anybody that's in that area, but we don't expect everybody to sign up right away. So we're gonna be doing some really focused outreach, um, including you know mailers, some welcome packets, we're gonna do some very targeted social ads, um, and then we're working with the recycling coordinator here and with haulers to continue to provide those messages to residents that are in that specific area. And then as we go, we'll also be doing a lot of engagement and education. So focus groups, information sessions, um, again, trying to help inform how the program works, but then also get input from those that are participating so that we can find ways to, to make improvements. And this will all happen starting in just a couple weeks, um, but want to show kind of the timeline for this pilot. So beginning in a couple weeks, really start that outreach and engagement work with residents, uh, recruit uh, people that want to sign up and participate in the pilot. That outreach will continue for the next few months through June at least. Um, but then starting in June and kind of through summer, we'll be starting that engagement work, collecting input, gathering feedback from those that are participating and then starting late summer, so around August and into September, start to make some of those changes, improvements, all with the goal that by end of September, early October, we'll start to be able to expand to other communities, starting with the pilot community, so expanding out to more of North St. Paul and then adding additional communities beyond that. And then from there, we're planning a, and this says all dates are approximate and subject to change because we don't know what we don't know. Um, this is hopefully this timeline follows just as planned and then if it does we'll continue to kind of uh, do that same process launch in more uh, communities including more areas here in North St. Paul learn more keep tweaking and eventually over the course of the next two to three years hopefully uh, we'll have it available to every resident in the two counties but want to walk a little bit before we run of course so that was very high level, very quick, um, but I wanted to kind of share what to expect, and if you have any questions, uh, we're happy to answer. Any questions? I think the only one that's gonna be in that uh, is gonna be you, Norby. Yeah, uh, I, I'm excited. I, I'm in, in, in the pilot square. area, so I, I look forward to this. To me, this is a wonderful, um, opportunity for all of our residents, and I can't wait till it expands. And I look forward to being 
part of your guinea pigs. Excellent. <laughs> you are our, our ambassador. <laughs> Absolutely. I think you move to First Avenue East, and then I can participate. So. I know it's not about me, but let's make it. <laughs> I think this is great. Thank you so much for showing up and bringing this to our attention. And um, I think this is really exciting for the community. I'm really excited about it. Um, so thank you. Yeah, of course. Yeah, thank you for your presentation. And uh, thank you, Commissioner Reinhardt, for being here as well. Um, one question I do have is kind of what are the, what is the scope of Organics. Sometimes when you do your home organics, it's very different than an a institutionalized way of managing it. So does that include bones and all those other things? Thank you. Yeah, Mr. Mayor, Commissioner, yes. So if you're familiar, maybe the easiest way to think about it is if you're familiar with the drop-off sites that exist around Ramsey County, anything that's accepted there should be acceptable in this program too. We'll be sending these food scrap bags to commercial compost facilities. So. Anything that is plant or animal based, so bones, meat products, dairy, any food, uh, vegetable scraps, trimmings, cuttings like that. Um, and we're, we're calling it the food scrap pickup program specifically because this is a new concept for a lot of people, so trying to focus on the food items, um, but other certified compostable items uh, like your paper towel or things like that will also be acceptable. And we'll have a full list of what's acceptable and what's not in all of the, the materials as we roll out to communities. You said the um, food scraps are going to be sent to commercial um, composters. Are, do you have it worked out where you're going to be able to, um, the, the Ramsey County and possibly Washington County, um, sites where the residents can go compost with to supply those areas? Yeah, Mr. Mayor, Commissioner, that, or Council Member, that's a great question. We've, we've been, over the last few years, we've been working on some uh, kind of compost market development strategies to raise awareness on the value of that finished compost. And we intend to continue doing that, especially as we're starting to send more of that material to those facilities, trying to bring it back and show how it can be useful in community gardens, backyard gardens. Um, so we've been doing some distribution over the last few years, especially to community gardeners. Um, and I think that there's a ton of opportunity to expand beyond that as well. Is there a minimum number of uh, households you're trying to um, recruit? I said saw 455, but <laughs> is there a goal? Yeah, Mr. Mayor, Council Member, uh, the goal overall for the pilot is up to that 2,200 total. So that'll be across the four pilot areas. Um, if we can hit that, that'll be great. Um, we'll see, you know, as we start to communicate and do some of that outreach, what kind of uh, interest we see. But I think if 455 households in North St. Paul are excited and sign up right away, then we'll take them. Did they also get a tour of the R&E Center? <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. Um, Mr. Mayor, Council Member, we, we are excited to have more and more tours and we would welcome any, we'd welcome the council, we'd welcome residents. Um, now on the R&E website, there's actually a, a page for tours um, and you can request, even if you're just an individual resident and not a part of a group, if you wanna come see the, the facility, you can, Fill out a really simple form and we'll follow up and find a date to have you come out and check out all of the, the interesting equipment we have. Thank you. Yeah. This is, this is fantastic. Thank you very much for sharing. I, it's been made to be very simple and I think simple work. So um, question is the defined area within North St. Paul, is that defined because that's a specific route of a truck for collection? So you can't, the enthusiasm is here. I mean, you can hear it. Mm -hmm. So I don't live in that, in that grid. So I can have this spiffy bag and I put it in my waist. It's not going to get to the right, okay. Correct, yeah. Mr. Mayor, council member. So there's a lot of factors that went into selecting these pilot communities, but one of them is based in the, the hauler that services that area and then where they take the waste. So that community is serviced by a hauler or haulers that will take the waste directly to the Arnie Center in, in Newport as opposed to going to like a transfer station. So all four of the communities have that same feature because uh, starting that way is a lot easier to coordinate and test some of these features 
once things go to the transfer station, it gets a little bit more complicated. So that, the transfer, transfer station piece will be in a future phase um, after we test some of these strategies. Okay. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Great. The team, appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. And our, Thank you, Sam Hansen. <laughs> um, I just wanted to say that um, the tours are pretty cool. So if you want to, we can certainly arrange um, if you want to do it as a city council and invite other folks to it. Um, the robotics that are pulling out, not only we have an organics line that will be utilized for this purpose, but also we have a robotics line to pick out um, the recyclables that I'm sure everybody wanted to recycle on their own but didn't. Um, and so we're really um, moving things forward in a very positive way. But if you want a tour, just let me know. I'd be happy to go with. Okay. Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your time. All right. Consent agenda. Does anybody want to talk about anything specific? We don't read it off, Brian? We certainly can. Thank you, Mayor. So on the consent, item A, uh, March 7th, 2023, workshop minutes. Item B, March 7th, 2023, regular meeting minutes. Item C, general claims of $1,186,692.68. Item D, HRA claims of $20,834.86. Item E, Ramsey County Library and North St. Paul use of fiber capacity agreement. Item F, North St. Paul Police Department, JPA and Court Service Amendment Renewal. Item G, Special Event, North St. Paul Friday Night Cruise, June 2nd through September 15th, 2023. Item H, Charitable Gambling Permit, North Metro Flex Academy, located at 2350 Helen Street North, May 12th, 2023. Item I, Resolution Accepting Donations for February of 2023. Item J, Building Permit Report, February 2023. Item K, resolution authorizing submission of an application to the Outdoor Recreation Grant Program for housing park improvements. Item L, MCES, uh, II Grant Program Agreement Resolution. And item M, 2022 Delegate Contract Process Agreement with State of Minnesota. Thank Motion to approve the consent agenda. Councilor Murphy. Second. 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 Tweers. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Uh, Mayor, Council, uh, John Schmall, 2750 Chisholm Avenue, North St. Paul. The subject is inspections Thursday pri uh, prior to the last Thursday. Knock on the door. Um, person says, I'm here to uh, inspect your furnace. And I had a furnace put in in December of 21, 15 months ago. And the individual standing in front of me, uh, first of all, if you asked any uh, the um, residents of uh, North St. Paul whether you know, the inspections were done by a contractor or the city or who was the, uh, the contractor, if in fact there was a contractor, I'd say 99% of the people would say, huh? Anyway, I, can't, I wouldn't say that because I've been at these meetings listening all the time and I'm looking for something that says MinSpec on this individual. He's standing in front of me, he has the required uh, thing around the neck with a hook on it and the card that says SAFE, S-A-F-E. So I said to him, SAFE, what's that? And he said, oh, oh, we bought MinSpec. So I don't know how you're to uh, tell individuals, residents, who will be inspecting, but it would be nice if there was a source and that the source be 
uh, something that has the actual company. And I, I said, safe, are you, did you, what, we bought out MinSpec. Oh, okay, MinSpec's gone. Oh, no, they still exist. So, you know, what's going on? Hard to understand. Uh, I said, uh, come on in. So, uh, and in talking to him as we went through this, I said, you never find anything wrong. And he says, oh, that's not true. Told the story of a uh, situation of a home that had a new furnace put in. The home was sold uh, very close to the installation. And uh, the, uh, when they got to the point of inspecting it, uh, the inspection had uh, the, uh, found a real major problem. And uh, I said, well, the homeowner probably didn't have an, uh, an inspection prior to purchasing it. And he said, no, wrong. They did have an inspection prior to purchasing it. And it was a situation where in your new furnace, you have the pipe that comes out, and it's supposed to come out this way. So it exhausts to the air. Well, the one they put in was like this, he said. And it was going up, which meant that the condensation didn't go out. And it was going back into the furnace. So um, just a story that these inspections are important and to be done quickly, maybe. And again, when you're looking at someone who says, I want to come in your house and inspect something, there should be, I should have some knowledge that knows who that person is going to be. Mayor, City Council, um, everybody's new except, I guess, Brian I've known for many years here. Uh, I did have somebody I knew very well, Victoria Reinhardt, behind me. She knows what I'm all about and that. And I, a question I'd have to ask the council, have you, have some of you been into my building or some of your children or yep. grandkids? Okay, so you, you have an idea what, what goes on there. Um, I think I still have tokens at the house. Do you? <laughs> Yeah, well, people do. It's it's funny because you go through them, and I have to replenish them a lot because it's funny that people would not bring them back. You know, can I pass some out to each? Is that okay? Thanks, Dennis. Much. Get in front of the mic. This is just something I had put together here. It was kind of a last minute thing, but it's something I've never I never really talked about or or flaunted or anything wanted, but I, I think it's important for you people to know where this started in nineteen ninety three. I was an executive in transportation for many years, so this was not what I did for a living. This was something I thought of, you know, maybe to do in later years and in retirement. And it's been a godsend for me, and I think it's been for this community and the surrounding ones, and I'll give you a little history. In 93, when we did this, I went to the city with the idea, as you can see, I gifted this building. And the reason was, I knew financially, because I had a background on that, that you feasibly couldn't make this thing work at the prices that you charge. Right now in the Twin City area, and I'm talking from Chanhassen over to all of western Wisconsin, there is one batting cage, and that's triple crown batting cages. And I should say there is one in St. Paul in the middle, but it's not... Not really a you know big time batting case. So we are we've been ranked number one for all 30 years. We even were ranked uh, Chicago Tribune ranked us as the upper Midwest regional one years back, which shocked me. But the building they gifted, you can see the concession building. I put the money to build that too back then. Um, the sound system for the high school and legion team. We we put a lot of 
time and effort there with people volunteering. They didn't have a sound system at the time, and I said, you can't, you can't have a fuel without a sound system. And we took care of that. I worked with Steve Rowe back then to get the T-ball shirts for all the kids every year, as long as they were in existence. The food shelf, and you'll see pictures on the back of what we've donated to the food shelf over the years, 17,500 pounds, and we hope to hit the 18,000 pound mark this year. The last picture you'll see is, and I'm sorry, it's everything's kind of green, it was my printer, but those are just thank you letters that I get from churches, organizations, charities, families that are suffering. Um, I can say in this in 30 years, I've never turned on one request, and I never would to this day. So I try to put a lot back into the community because that's, that's what it's about. You know, I found out about the toy shelf. Uh, Norma Worm has been a friend of mine. I got down there to see that, that thing is beautiful. And uh, next day I sent her a check and said, do what you need with this. Gift cards, I've been big on that over the holidays. Do that anonymously. One I always do is that veterans home that we built across from uh, the veterans park, you know, for the, I think it's for the veterans who don't have a place to go. I always put one in the mailbox and just say from one military family to another because I have a history of um, United States Rangers, Derby Rangers. My son-in-law is a special ops ranger right now. He's been in 20 years, so he's done some uh, wonderful things. But going back um, with this, you know, this has been a godsend, I think. Right now, I ask people where, where they come from when they come in, if they're new especially. I've had people tell me they come from Mount or Chanas and Maple Grove. I get Western Wisconsin a lot now, Hudson, New Richmond, Osceola, Prescott. They're coming over Eau Claire. I've had a family come down from Duluth one day on a Saturday, spent about five hours here, and had to go somewhere for lunch. And I always tell the people the same thing, head for Max, or you got a pizza place you can go to. But I think Max has uh, been a real plus thing for this community that we've had that. So I've been able to push some business there. Um, over the years, you know, the people and the kids that I've seen especially, what I'll say about this, the kids that come in that door and the families, I hear, yes, sir, no, sir, thank you, please. They're the nicest young people, and it's what America should be about. And I think you know what I'm talking about because it's, it's all different. But it comes from the parents that bring them in. They're all, these kids are involved in sports. They have, you know, peers that they hang with. and. Just, it's fun to be around her. I spend a lot of time there and, and visit with the families and that. And uh, I've seen kids go on with scholarships, you know, and I've taught some of them. But I've get some that come back. One is a uh, uh, nuclear physicist out of the U of M. I, she was a valedictorian in her class. I've had doctors, dentists, um, lawyers, you name it. They've, it's It's been just a treat to see these people come back. And what do they say to you at my age is, yeah, I'm bringing my kid here now. And one guy had said, and my grandkids are here now too. When I, so it's, it's really a nice thing to see. You know, we had this um, lease coming up here. And back when we did this, I'm on the first city council when I was there, Bill Sandberg was mayor. Some of the names were on there, Leon Lilly, um, Betty McCollum, a congresswoman, and in Washington. Chuck Weger was involved somewhat. Victoria Reinhardt has, has worked with me over the years. These are the people that uh, helped me jumpstart it. I told them the day I opened them doors, I said, I'll promise you one thing, the city of North St. Paul will never pay one penny on this building. And to this day, they never have. All repairs are done by me. Last year, I put in $20,000 to upgrade the uh, the ramp for the handicap, you know, a lot of stones, uh, the uh, guardrails and that. So, which, you know, it's part of business. So, Brian mentioned a new roof was put on this year and due to hail damage. So, that's brand new. So, we've got, you know, good things going. That's where that money goes. I, you know, I keep putting that back in and in the community as much as I can. So, what I'm asking 
is for us to continue on. We've done this 15, 10, 5, and I would ask that if we can keep this going, I'd, I'd like to go for another five. I don't know where I'll be in five years. We'll talk about it as we go, but I would hope down the road um, the business, you know, belongs to me that I would find somebody maybe who would take this, who is a local, and continue this tradition because it affects so many people. It's, it's, it's really touches me to see what we've done. And every week I get people that shake my hand. I got people that hug me, thank me that we're there because they would have nowhere to go. There's training centers they can go to, but they're so expensive that you can't afford to do it, especially if you got more than one kid. It's, it's tough. So we try to, you know, take care of that. Over the years, the success, if you want to talk to sports, all these communities around here, from Matamita to Stillwater to Woodbury to Tartan, North St. Paul themselves, have all seen teams go to the state tournaments. Stillwater's won one, Woodbury. North St. Paul won a couple of girls. A couple of girls that pitched for them were the Varlin girls, Denise and Sue. It's just funny that their nephews right now are pitching for the Milwaukee Brewers and the Minnesota Twins, and they grew up in my cages, and I'm so pleased to say that. I have pictures of both of them, autographs, jerseys, and they're, they're wonderful kids. So, And I've had a lot of people come through my door. Jack Moore spent two days with me doing a promo, and uh, the Quillen boys from Hill Murray, Tommy and Rob, 30, 20 years in the majors between them. So. I've seen a lot of people over there. Jerry Bell, you know Tom Kelly, you know they've been they've been in to see him, and they're quality people. So, and uh, it's just been a, it's been a wonderful thing. That small area that we take up outside that old field fence, it's not a very big area, but the impact it has for the, the Twin City area is huge. And I would hope we would consider to keep this thing moving on. That's what I'm asking for. So. And I'm here to, you know, make sure it happens so you can believe that and you can trust that. So it's always been there. Is there anything I can answer for you? I certainly will. How's it been for the with the fields not having as much with the North St. Paul kids not having the program anymore? Has it been affecting your business as far as the people come number of people coming in? You, you know, it's sad because right now it's, it's pay for play. The city of St. Paul had the Bill Peterson, who's a personal friend of mine, Frank White. Bill Peterson, if you know William, coached Creed for years. He's an institution. Paul Molitor, Dave Winfield are his people. His field over there is beautiful. They, that program is done this year. They don't have kids to play. And part of it is the costs are just, they can't do it, you know. As far as the fields where we're at, once they're outside, you know, things slow down for me then, but there's always places where they have to come in and use the cages. So not, not too much. You know, we, we have the baseball fields there, and uh, it's funny, a lot of the baseball players don't come in before because they, they take bad practices, teams, but the fields definitely are a plus. I'm the only one to ever put one out of ballpark before. So people before they play will come in and take a few swings, you know. And I get to know them. One of the big, big leagues and big, a lot of people that come in and this is kind of interesting. It plays up at Goodrich and it's the sober league, they call themselves. They're recovering alcoholics and, and addicts. They come in and they're the most wonderful people. Um, and to see him be involved in this is, is really a really a godsend. So it's fun to see that. And the kids in the area that are playing ball, they go to other places. They go to Tartan. They go, you know, they can go to other ones. I think uh, Maplewood absorbed a lot of them. And uh, you know, we do what we can to encourage kids. And so we see that a lot of the programs are strong, but a lot of them have dipped over the years. But a lot of that's cost. Yeah, just plain cost. Staff that work with you during the summer. How do you get your? Yeah, I do. You know, the kids who work. I I put in a lot of the hours. The kids who work for me are high school kids. They can be ball players, and every one of them knows it. It's the only job in the world where you can tell your boss when you feel like working. 
you know, I work around their schedules. They don't work around mine. If they've got, you know, I got Eagle Scout, one kid, um, other ones play ball, other ones are swimming track, whatever. We work with them in that, and they don't work more than five hours a week, maybe 10 during the summer. Right now, hardly any, you know, I got one kid working tonight, so uh, he hadn't worked for two months, but, and they're good kids. I always, I always find good people there, so. And they're usually the kids that walk through the door, and you know right away that they're good, so. Thank you for your presentation. Okay, guys, well, I hope we, Hope something can be resolved. We can continue this because it's coming up. I'm glad we had a chance to talk yeah. about it. And we're looking at the whole McKnight sure. Field, you know, yeah. the complex just to see where everything is. And yeah. our boys played up there, you know, sure. hitting the ball. So we appreciate your dedication to the. Yeah. To the well, I, I and I appreciate the time you spent here. And I'll say this just to finish. Triple Crown is is not only North St. Paul. It's a destination for North St. Paul. It's put North St. Paul out there. Because people would even say, where are you at? And when I tell them, they're like, oh, North St. Paul. And now people know it. Mm -hmm. And part of it is, it's Triple Crown. That's where they go. If you know the Batty Caves, they all point to that corner. So that's good. I appreciate this information, okay. how you laid it out. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Appreciate your time. Thank you. You bet. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Close the meeting of the public. Now, the next is oh, we got there. Go ahead. is uh, going to have Sue. Are you going to are we going to do the approved referendum? Do we just speak first? Or are you going to read it first? I'll read it first. Okay. Mind. <clears throat> Thank you, Mayor. So, the item that we have on the city business action items tonight is uh, a memorandum of understanding between the city of North St. Paul and the Historical Society. Um, <clears throat> So the Historical Society works to promote uh, an awareness of North St. Paul's history of residents and visitors through education, interpretation, presentations, and preservation. Uh, the Historical Society is responsible for operating and maintaining a museum devoted to collecting, preserving, and exhibiting historical artifacts for the city of North St. Paul. They're located at 2666 7th Avenue East here in North St. Paul. Uh, the city is authorized by state statute, including Minnesota state statutes 471.93 and 138.053 to appropriate public funds to or on behalf of the Historical Society to collect, preserve, and exhibit data and material pertaining to the history of the city and for general promotion of Historical Society's work. So what we are looking for, um, the purpose of the MOU is to establish a mutual understanding the nature of the extent of financial support the city has traditionally and will continue to provide to the Historical Society subject to annual budgetary review and possible modification by the City Council. Either party may terminate this relationship and memorandum of understanding at any time with or without cause upon written notification to the other party. Um, obligations of the Historical Society as consideration for the funding provided herein, the Historical Society will continue to operate and maintain its museum, providing programs and educational materials relevant to North St. Paul history. Uh, funding and support from the city as consideration for the satisfactory performance of the Historical Society's mission and obligations. The city is looking to um, provide $3,000 per year to, for the Historical Society for support of its operations and activities. The um, city will pay electric, water, and sewer utility bills for the museum uh, with periodic mowing at the museum in the summertime. Um, they do flag replacement, Public Works does, um, as needed at the museum, and maintain and repair the sprinkler system down there as well. Um, these added up together probably come to somewhere to eight, maybe $9,000 a year is what that cost is. Um, but this, so this is a memorandum of understanding um, to be executed through your guys' support. Yes, sir, Mayor. Um, one thing I'd add is this is, we, the city has been providing many of these services um, already. And so one of the things that uh, Brian's been working on that um, as the lawyer, I appreciate is kind of cleaning up some things, making sure that the things we're doing when we show support and that we're authorized to do, we're memorializing these things and it's more of a conscious effort, if you will. So when we're asked, what are we doing? What are we providing? 
how much does that actually cost the city? Some of these uh, specifics are actually being memorialized in these memorandum of understanding. So, it, so that it's clear that one, yes, we can do this, and two, here's how much it's costing us, and yes, it was purposeful. So um, this is something that's been going on. I, I won't necessarily call this cleanup, but in some respects it is to make sure that it's put in front of you, conscious decision with uh, just a lot more clarity in, in terms of our relationship with them. So that is kind of part of the intent tonight. Thank you. Appreciate that because you know it's a great relationship and it should be out there so we all understand. So everybody realizes what it is and the historical society is near and dear to my heart just because of North St. Paul's rich history and everything that provides with a wealth of knowledge with Sue Springborn and and um, Paul Anderson and just the the hard work that the whole team does and I'm glad we we're able to uh, support them and be able to uh, continue on with our rich history. Any questions, or do we want to bring that to a motion? No, I, I fully support everything here, and Brian, thank you for rereading it, because when I read it the first time, I didn't see the clause that it can be um, terminated by either party at any given time. Um, as we've sat through um, the last hour and a half or so, we have a lot of non-ending <laughs> programs. So that was the only boundary that I wanted to make a recommendation that we add to it, but it's already in there. and. Um, I'm glad I listened to you when you read it, so, so I'm good to go. Um, just a point, point of clarity, because I don't know, does the Historical Society go to Henry, or is that a little park there in that triangle that the, um, the military weapon's on? Come on up. I wanted you to come up anyways, and you said no to me, so yeah. now you have to come up. <laughs> Paul Anderson says that we own that, that the Historical Society owns that site. When I became president a few years ago, oh, by the way, I should say, I'm Sue Springborn, 2573 13th Avenue, near St. Paul. Um, <laughs> um, uh, when I became president, I was not knowing anything about anything, and the leaders that we had had, except for Paul Anderson, passed away. And so I'm going through these drawers one day, and I had noticed that the flags were getting really ratty looking, and I thought, what the heck here, who does this? Well, then you find all kinds of agreements from 30 years ago, but nothing recent. So that park was, that actually was memorial, Veterans Memorial, and there is a plaque there that said it is, says it is the Veterans Memorial. And I have found paperwork that, um, the Historical Society, the Legion, and the VFW cooperated to put that up. But if you talk to the other two entities, they don't know anything about it. <laughs> <laughs> so I have no idea. We're maintaining that, and well, the city cuts the grass, and we have had members that went out and do things with the weeds, and now the city for sure is doing the flags. But it's kind of an up in the air kind of thing. I, that's one of, right now we have a person, um, uh, Elaine Exted, and her mother was Priscilla Olson, who was one of the founding members of the Historical Society, and she's determined to get all this stuff organized, and she's doing a great job. So I'm hoping that we'll find something. I believe that property belongs to the Historical Society, but does that mean the canon belongs to us? I don't know. Those things are up in the air. Did I answer your question? That we don't know. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, one of the reasons why I was wondering is, um, I was if it was a city's or, or yours, I was wondering if, if part of this memorandum of understanding, um, along with all the other parks that we do, if we would want to put a trash container at that particular park because there isn't one um, that, that, that we would maintain. Wonderful. Because... Right now, I'm in the cleaner upper, yeah, and there's a fair amount of it in the summer. Yeah. That's not a problem. And do you guys have trash cans outside of the door? Out no, there? you don't. We don't. And so sometimes they take away from, you know, the beauty of of the park aesthetically. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So yeah. we can work together of what makes more sense for you and where and a good placement for it. Uh, that would be nice. That would be nice because people do sit there and yeah. And I will tell you that um, uh, the history cruisers donated $2,000 to us 
for our new sign. We're going to have a new sign. It's going to look, you may not even notice because it's going to look just like it does now, except it's going to be nice and new. So do you have any questions for me about? Yeah, I have a question. Thank you sure. for, for being here. And um, I was just wondering, how many people are you getting through the door every year? Well, I wish I had counted because it's it's one day, one weekend, you'll get 15. Then the next two weeks, you we get nobody. Mm -hmm. But then you have the holiday hop, which this year we only had 55 for some reason. Last year we had way over 100. So it, it varies. And the um, we do have people that keep the museum open during the car show. And that's kind of funny because one night, again, they'll get 10 and then they'll get nobody. So it's and we just had a meeting at the Historical Society with a group called the Ramsey County Historical Network. And it's, uh, it's nothing formal or legal. There's no minutes. There's nothing like that. It's people from Minnesota Historical Society, Ramsey County Historical Society, White Bear, uh, Shoreview, New Brighton, North St. Paul. Um, just uh, There was 21 people there. And um, we just sit around and talk about our problems or our wonderful things that have happened and, and what we're doing. And it's so interesting because everybody's in a different place. Some people get a lot of support from their city, but a good share of them get in-kind support, which is almost better in, in some ways than the money because there's kind of no end on it. So um, it's, it's variable. But... Um, I'm going to tell you now that I'm standing here that on the 28th, we're going to put on kind of a fun program. Um, two years ago, the Lilly family called us and asked us if we wanted these old bound newspapers, North St. Paul Review. And Paul, Paul Stallman, or Joe Stallman and I went over and we we're not going to take them. We don't have room. We're not going to take them. And we looked at them and we thought, we've got to have them. So we took them. Well, then um, a few months ago, I got a phone call from Terry Furlong and the owner of the Lilly Building, the new owner, had contacted him. There was a whole room in that basement, probably this whole size, full of shelves, full of bound volumes from, um, they weren't all real old, but from every municipality around that, that the Lilly newspaper published. So the last two months I've been going in that building periodically with different people and we pretty much got it cleaned out, but it's been very interesting. So on the 28th, Paul Anderson is gonna do a little presentation about the newspapers in North St. Paul, the Sentinel, the um, Courier, and the, the Ramsey County Review. And then we are going to have artifacts, and a lot of it truly would be called artifacts, and bound newspapers sitting on tables, and people can just look at everything. It's really great fun. And we do have people that come in just to look at, because we've got the newspapers from the 1800s. And you can go to the Minnesota Historical Society. Most of those are on microfiche. But it's kind of fun to actually touch the newspapers, even though they're crumbling, <laughs> it is very interesting. So that's the twenty eighth of this. Week. The twenty eighth at seven o'clock, <clears throat> and cookies and coffee will be served. Well, so okay. any questions? <laughs> Thank you. No? Thank, Thank you, you so much, and your in your group for everything you do. Thank you. Greatly appreciate it. Thanks a lot. I move for a motion. I move. All right. Councilmember Wong, second. second. Second, Council Member Swears. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Right. All right, next. To you, you again. Thank you, Mayor. Reports from City Manager and Departments. So uh, we had a staff meeting today. Uh, the Fire Department's doing some code compliance cleanup, which is really good, taking care of some issues that have been around for a while. Um, they're also gonna be doing live burn training at the training center here shortly, as well as doing some ice rescue out on um, Silver Lakes. So it was kind of neat last year. I think they got a couple of airboats out there from, or one anyway, from Ramsey County. It was out there, participated in the training. Uh, Electric department's been uh, doing ongoing maintenance throughout the winter, um, as well as tree trimming. Unfortunately, we've been having some issues lately. There's been a lot of wire theft, probably over $20,000 worth of it. Um, we're, I think we're narrowing in on who might be responsible for that. So more to come. It's really unfortunate. Um, <clears throat> finance has got through their audit. Uh, they did a great job as always. Um, 
and they have their new accountant that will be starting on April 10th. Looking forward to her coming. She's got a lot of good experience behind her. Um, Public Works has been a little busy with snow, um, but they've also uh, been doing interviews, or, or they will be doing some interviews. They had 22 applications, and they will be interviewing six people for that position, so good luck to them. Um, they've had, uh, to date, four water main breaks. Normally they have about eight this time of year, so, which is good, because they've been kind of busy with snow. <coughs> uh, and also they will be doing um, some sewer cleaning, which will be the avenues uh, in the area south of Highway 36. We have a contractor coming in to start that. Uh, we'll have more information on the website, of course, about that as well. Um, PD, uh, they've been, they are hiring an officer. Um, they're in the process of uh, interviews and zeroing in on who they like, so it looks like they have a couple good candidates, which is great. Um, community development, uh, Brandy's been a great asset to the city in the short time she's been here. They're, she's working on grants, they're doing a lot of cleanups and finalization of older projects that have been hanging around, um, and of course processing permits as well. And that is the extent of my report. Thank you very much. Appreciate Thank you. It. All right, reports from council commissions and committees. Council member Norby, do you have anything? No, I didn't. The Planning Commission will be um, in about a week and week and a half. I'm looking forward to that one. Um, and also I'd like to say I, the city workers have been working around my property and I'd like just to extend um, my heartfelt thanks about how wonderful they do and how professional they are. Um, I, I think all the residents are here really blessed with um, how good the people we have working for us. So thank you very much. Thank you. Council Member Warren. Uh, in regards to um, the uh, um, committees, the Arts and Culture Committee met on the 8th, and um, they're working really hard. They have several subgroups, and so I believe they'll be launching their first project here um, before um, probably July, June, July. So I'm really looking forward to it and um, wondering what y'all think. <laughs> but... Um, Yes, very, very um, productive group. And that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you. We have a meeting tomorrow, and I don't have any updates until the next time we all meet. All right. So there well, you go. We have a great meeting tomorrow. And again, kudos to all of our public works as this, this snow. Clearly, we are not ending winter in Minnesota yet. So, Council Member Cole. I have nothing at this time. All right. Can we. Can, did we talk about the EDA the last time, or was it? Okay. But if there's any topics from EDA you'd like to, no, I bring, can't remember we discussed it. There wasn't a, there wasn't a whole lot of memorable. Yeah, I mean, I know, other, yeah. other than reviewing old of yeah. of information. I remember we talked about something. Yep. So I have nothing that way. Up general business, general business on. Uh, how about you, Council Member Norby? Council Member Long. Yeah. Um, I meant to say this in the last um, update, but uh, the arts and the painting night is happening on um, this Monday, I think. Oh, Thursday. Thank you, Carrie. Um, so that's been dropped down to $10, too. We just really want people to come in and enjoy themselves, and we just really, it'll be guided by um, Lisa Ritchie, and so we're really looking forward to ha having a lot of fun, and it'll be at Casey Lake. So have a good night. Nothing more at the time. All right, thank you. Um, myself, I was able to go with uh, <clears throat> to do a do a tour of the park with. Uh, so um, I always want to say Phil, but Public Works. Ron. Ron, thank you. <laughs> Ron and I had a good uh, a good uh, view of that facility, and we looked around and was able to understand a little better. So I appreciate that. Also, I met with our. Uh, our Brian and I met with our uh, Christine, our superintendent at the schools last Friday. So we had a good meeting. It was a couple hours, I think, by the time we were done. So we're looking at uh, understanding the 
as far as the, the police involvement with, with North and the, all the, and the schools and where we're at is looking at that and with the field. So we're kind of, that was part of this whole comprehensive view of the, of the McKnight complex and the schools as far as looking at the, the safety and understanding where they're at with the police. We have a one full time up at the North right now just to understand the school needs and the community needs for the children as well and the students we have there. And she also mentioned the addition's gonna be done in uh, the end of uh, summer. So next year at, um, they're going to be in the one building. You're not gonna have to go back to the, the building that they're in for administrative. So they'll all be in one building all the time. So that's gonna help, she said as well, being able to have everybody in the one building. So that's all I have. So I'll call for adjournment if there's nothing else. I did it this time. I didn't adjourn without asking, <laughs> didn't I? So don't leave me hanging. So moved. Thank you. Councilmember Cole. Second. Second Councilmember Sears. All those in favor say aye. 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 Thank you, everyone.